Wave Act, the web-free software company that understands what you want. Hi everyone, welcome at Wave Act. Today with Liam Damody, who is growth marketer, brand uh, marketer and LinkedIn strategist. And today we will talk about how to scale go-to-market strategies. I'm super hyped to have you here. Thanks, mate, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And Absolutely. yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've been a fan of uh, the, the conversations that you've been putting out for some time now. We've been connected for a while, and uh, it's great to finally uh, meet face-to-face -face or digitally face-to-face -face and Likewise. have a conversation. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, again, thank you for taking the time. And I would... Uh, love to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about your i don't know your life your job whatever you're passionate about sure. and yeah or maybe yeah, so yeah first and foremost uh you know i'm, I'm a family man uh i uh, have a fantastic wife that i've been married to for almost 10 years now we've been together for 14 we have two kids uh three and just coming up on six um, professionally, I've sort of been a jack of all trades most of my career, um, master of none. Um, I am very passionate about people and products and process. Um, and uh, that love of those three things has kind of just evolved into me being a bit of a problem solver. So I'll go work at a startup and uh, a or a tech company and they're looking to build something new or uh, the larger company that's looking to build something new from within. And I'll go into that company and um, start working on building that right um and so um you know i i really uh believe that the older i get the more i believe that if you just follow your fascination you will manifest your own serendipity right that's kind of my my like line <laughs> that i say to people because i talk to a lot of people who are always really nervous about well, what should we do how do we do it where do we get there and uh, i always say if you just follow what you're passionate about follow your fascination like nine times out of 10, you can't go wrong with that approach. Um, because you'll love what you're doing. And you'll get in, you'll attract people that are that are interested in doing the things that you like doing. And then all of a sudden, you've got collaborations and amazing things happen from there. So um, very much a, a, a believer in that. Um, I started in recruiting uh, out of college, I worked at a uh, staffing firm, and then I went to work at a technology startup um, that stopped hiring basically immediately after I joined the company. And wow. rather than, you know, sit around and wait for hiring to start again, I was like, look, like we're in the middle of launching something new, like, where can I help? And so they threw me in a couple projects. I taught myself HTML, I built a CMS system, like, uh, went and worked on the product team for a while, the project team for a while. And we launched this big portal. And it was just amazing, right? That was my first experience at a startup. Um, and I just I, I got the bug at that point. Um, and have been building things, whether at a small company or at a larger company, but building something from the ground up is what I'm kind of addicted to. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I eventually evolved into more of like a sales operations, revenue operations, product operations kind of um, uh, professional where I was basically um, helping teams scale, right? Like how do we build a stand up a sales organization uh, in uh, outbound sales, inbound sales, marketing, make sure that, you know, the, the marketing funnel is full of leads for those folks, uh, analyzing the performance of sales people, and then also right through to customer success, right? Like the revenue operations role that has evolved is now, um, it's not just sales ops, it's not marketing ops, it's all of it, right? Um, anything relating to revenue process is, is something that falls within revenue operations, and that's the passion of mine. Um, and then now I'm actually working in employer brand marketing for, for a, a digital consultancy, um, which again, sort of that follow your fascination theme, right? Uh, the chief marketing officer of my company saw what I was posting on LinkedIn, saw my background and was interested in having me come in and, and basically they had this new role that they were building to try and start up a new function internally. And we talked about it and he was like, I don't have a job description for you or anything. And I was like, cool, no worries. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> uh, and so I just jumped in and have been having a ton of fun ever since. Those are the best words where you just uh, jump into the intercomplete, also maybe a new uh, subject or just something different, right? It's yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's, I've, I've always, as much as I'm an operations mind and an operations person, uh, 
I love marketing and I love marketing messaging. I love branding. Um, so that's kind of the passion for me. Like operations is what I'm really good at, but then, you know, marketing is also something I'm really passionate about. And so the opportunity to jump in and start doing that was really exciting for me and I'm having a blast. Awesome. Um, yeah, you said, said a couple of very interesting things now, and I want to go back to the question that you are being asked all the time, <clears throat> as it seems, and that's how do you actually get into that? Right. Um, I know you said a couple of different uh, professions now mm -hmm. and one can't do all at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. But basically, what kind of, let's say, key takeaway looking back would you I say to someone who is just getting started? Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so just getting started. It's, it's having an open mind and being willing to do anything. Because when you're just getting started, you've got this clean slate that you can fill with knowledge and fill with learnings and information. Um, and, you know, you're not necessarily sure what you want to do yet. You're not necessarily sure what you're going to be doing 20 years from now. And there's not really a good way to find out. I mean, you can take personality tests and all sorts of different stuff. But really, just going with the flow and being able to try new things, do new things, like not be afraid of failing, not be afraid of taking on new challenges that you've never done before. I think a lot of people sometimes get hung up on the fact that they're like, well, I don't know how to do that. It's like, okay, learn, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> a lot of people, mo most people who learned how to do anything didn't know how to do it at some point in time, right? So have an open mind, have a growth mindset, uh, find a project or something that you're excited about and just, just don't worry too much about, is this the right thing for me, right? Everybody overthinks. They're like, is this, is this my career? Is this what I'm meant to do? Don't worry about it. Just focus on, are you having fun doing it right now? And if you, if the answer to that question is yes, just keep going. And if you start to have less fun and the amount of fun that you're having outweighs and, and counterbalances the, 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 the negativity is out, outweigh. It's the, if you have less fun than you have fun, then you start thinking, okay, maybe it's time to find something else. Right. Um, on a consistent basis. Uh, the other thing I would say is you have to be adaptable, right? So like, Building a startup from scratch is hard. 90% uh, of them fail for a reason, right? And so you have to be able to go into it and say, okay, we just put all that work in and we just proved that that doesn't work. We got to scrap it and go back to the drawing board and figure out the next approach, right? And if you are the type of person that is, ma is frustrated by that, frustrated is fine. But like, if you're the type of person who can't handle that, like you're like, I just can't do that then startups are not for you, period, like full stop. Um, but you, if you are somebody who like, okay, we tried it, we put it out there, it didn't work, onto the next thing. How do, we, how do we figure out the next problem? Then that's the kind of mindset that you have. So those are some of the things that I would say, if you're interested in working in startup companies um, and obviously Web3 is a startup industry, uh, it's moving quickly, it's moving fast. There are more unknowns than there are knowns. And you have to be okay with that. And I think that's the third piece I would say, I've always been pretty comfortable with ambiguity. Um, like I said, my current role, you know, there wasn't a job description drafted when I, when I agreed to take it. And I'm okay with that because it, it sounded like something really awesome. Um, and that is very much something that you need to be able to do. Like you have to be able to say, okay, well, there's no clear defi clearly defined role for me. There's no like, I don't know what necessarily I have to do next. I'm just going to go with the flow. Um, and that is essential if you're going to be successful at building a, a company from the ground up. Absolutely. Um, especially when you said changing your mind, right? Which I consider a key strength indicator, maybe <laughs> um, of founders in general. So um, that, that's, that's definitely a big, big thing in my humble opinion. Um, but one thing that I discovered for myself, and I'm curious on your opinion on that, is you need to be flexible in your approach, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some things which I believe shouldn't be changed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that and, and that's. I think that that is that that is the 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 challenge of building something from scratch. It's like figuring out what those things are, right? What can move and what can't. Um, and I think if you're starting a business, you have to be crystal clear on, um, you know, 
be crystal clear on what it is that you're trying to accomplish, what problem you're trying to solve. You have to have a really good understanding of how to explain that, right? Especially in Web3, because in Web3, it's not as broadly understood. And so the problems that you're solving, you probably understand what they are, but does the client or the lead that you're trying to go after really understand what, what it is? And so you have to have a meticulous uh, ability to communicate what the problem you're solving is. Um, and you have to sort of be very driven and understand this is my vision, this is my focus. For the next year, this is what we're going for towards and this is how we're gonna get there. Everything else like, is on the periphery, right? You, you just want to make sure that everything is front and center and you're all focused on that one specific mission and objective. Um, and you don't really stray from it. And then that, again, that narrative, like what are we trying to, what are we trying to do here and why is it valuable? You have to be crystal clear on that value proposition and not waver from it if you can avoid it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in, as I said, tech related industries, web free and so on people oftentimes get hung up on their solution that they're building, which they mm -hmm. think makes sense, right? Right, yes. And yeah, oftentimes, in my humble opinion, it should be validated much more, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, you know, when you sent over some of the questions that you sent over earlier, I was, it was great that you sent those, that, it was great that you sent those across because that actually um, had me sort of really thinking about it. And you know, one of the things that you have to make sure that you're doing is is measuring and understanding your audience, listening to your audience, listening to the the things that you're doing, and and seeing like, is this working the way I expected it to work? And if the answer is no, you don't just ignore it and say, well, we're going to keep going forward. <laughs> like it's like, well, wait, why isn't it working? Right? Like always be thinking about, is this the right approach? Should we be tweaking things here and there? Um, there's a lot of examples of companies that failed because their founders were dead set on doing things the way they thought they should be done and the, the market was telling them something else right the market was saying that's not what we want you have to be really focused on that yeah absolutely um i, I even think that's less of kind of a personality trait it's something uh that that's more related to experience what do you think because yeah i, th I think you certainly get a lot more focused on listening and understanding and adapting to what you're what you're processing uh the more experience you get under your belt right um when you're earlier in your career you're you're even if you're highly analytical you just don't have as much of a frame of reference so you don't have as much experience to compare what you're going through with whereas for me like i have 20 years of experience where i can say okay this reminds me of that time that i did this and this and this and okay how did i handle that situation like you can and you have a little bit more confidence because you've done this before right and that's the wisdom that comes with having built things but it, but again web3 is brand new right so that it, there's there's a lot of disruption that will happen to the traditional way of doing things i think you also just talked about confidence um when, when i look at many web3 companies or startups and also look at my own first startup that i had um i i would even say also myself have been very overly confident about, mm -hmm. you know, which might be a lack of uh, market validation, right? But um, also, as I said, a missing frame of experience, reference, right? Um, but I guess that that's, that that's an interesting point, right? When it comes to confidence, is that, you know, as you're building startups, uh, as I understood it on a regular basis, or at least support companies doing that or startup like um, environments. Um, what, what kind of correct characteristics in a founder did you experience for yourself have the right mindset to build something from the ground up? I think that could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one, it's it's conviction, right? Like you, you have to be so passionate about the, the the company that you're building and the problem that you're trying to solve um and it has to be unwavering confidence and, and conviction right because you're going to get way more no's than you are yeses right and there's going to be an intense competition there's going to be a lot of challenges and you know you're i've never been a founder myself and 
I think part of the reason that I've never, like I view myself more as kind of a, an operator that helps the founder figure out how to get things done. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that if you're gonna be the founder of a business, you, you're, you're the chief sales person, right? You're the chief marketing person. You are you know, the visionary who's setting the, the path and, and the strategy for the company. And you're the one that ultimately has to take the responsibility of the success of the company on your shoulders. And everybody that's in that company that's working their ass off for you, like they're looking to you for strength and, and confidence and confirmation that you know what they're doing to help build is actually a good move <laughs> for them, right? Um, so you have to be very, very, very passionate. And in all of the founders that I've ever worked with have that, right? They are incredibly passionate. Like, you could tell them that their idea is horrendous and they will tell you 25 different ways that it's not. And by the time you finish talking about it, you're like, Hmm, maybe it's not that horrendous. You know, <laughs> like that you just, they can sell their concept to anybody. Um, and then I think, you know, that other part, part of it is, is the most successful founders are the ones that can kind of say, okay, this was my, this is my hypothesis. This is how we're going to test it. Did it work? Yes or no. Why, why not? Okay. What are we gonna what are we gonna do next to, to, to figure out our next play um, and the best founders are the ones that are willing to put their ego aside and say I'm bullish on this business idea I'm bullish on this concept we tried a couple things that didn't work we're gonna put those in the past and move on to the next thing uh, the, the founders that I think fail are the ones that are like no, the, the the customer doesn't get it. The client doesn't get it. It's like no, the, it's on you as the founder of the business to make sure that your your go to market strategy conveys the value of your business. And if you can't do that effectively, you're not going to be a successful founder. I think that's pretty pretty key. Absolutely. Um, I I think it was with you, right? Uh, when we talked about Gary V. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Love yeah. Gary v. Yeah. Accountability. Basically, it's that. Right, uh, yes. take accountability for your probably sometimes bad decisions. Right. Yeah. So, and 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 I think the other thing is like the thing that I love about Gary V and the con the, the things that he mentions are like the accountability component, but but also the empathy. Right. Like it's it you, you don't. It, it's okay to be accountable. You should be accountable for the decisions that you make, but you should also have some self compassion. Right. You're a human being still. You make mistakes, and that's okay. I think a lot of the challenge that founders sometimes run into is this, this idea that like you're infallible and you can't make mistakes and that's just not the case right you have to be okay making mistakes failure is more common than anything in, in startups and so you're trying new things that just comes with the territory so if you say you know yeah we made a mistake and that's going to happen that's fine like that's a good message to, to 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 say and to hear and your employees need to hear you saying it you know um so I'm all about that messaging. Absolutely. Um, I remember reading his book when he said, uh, talking about a former employee who's, I think it was, he stole or, or she stole wine from him. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I, I'm not 100% clear anymore about the story. It's a while ago, but basically, uh, he was really hurt emotionally, obviously. Yeah. Right? It's a, trust is broken and everything but um in the end when he talked with him i think it was him um then it was for really really reasonable uh reasons i, I think he was just in really deep financial struggles and all that kind of stuff and that changes things right yep yep yeah i mean yeah. it's it's being empathetic and understanding people's situations. Uh, I think that's probably another thing that I didn't think about prior to this, but you have to care about your team and you have to understand where they're at. And I think a lot of founders sometimes are like, we're just going to work, 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 work. Like we have a mission, we have to accomplish it. We have to, and it's like, no, no, they're people too, right? You have to understand their specific situation, their scenarios, understand what motivates them. I mean, that's what true leadership is. You know, you, you don't manage any one person the same way you sort of tailor your leadership strategy to, to a specific person because you understand what motivates them and what drives them and how they react to um you know to, to instruction or or just ideas etc um so yeah i think that's a great point understanding where they were at and why what motivated them it doesn't make them a bad person they were just in really crappy situations and circumstances and sometimes people make unwise decisions when that's the case right yeah absolutely 
um, that also gets me back to the, let's say you work for your employees, right? And yeah, totally. and also with the notion of don't expect them to work as hard as you do that, that flipped a yep. switch in me, but yep. yeah. Um, but basically, as you said, with looking at all these startups and environments that you have gone through in your career, basically, um, are there, because that's a, that's a point that I think is really interesting in general, because let's put it that way. When you're scaling a startup, right? You're growing, you have, uh, you're starting to have somewhat of a business as usual, which, which goes back to the, how to scale your business, right? then uh, you might want to think about adding structured processes. You might want to think about how to drive my business by more data, by metrics, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think it's in general a no brainer to do that. But the main issue question is how far should you go to not get caught up in the processes and in the numbers itself without leaving the actual growth and strategy on the table. What's your experience with that? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, th I think uh, just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding the question, you're saying like, h how, how should you be prioritizing sort of flexibility versus process, like the rigidity of process and data versus mm. I don't know if I the question. Not, not necessarily more about, let's put it that way, uh, when or how much should you introduce those things, right? Because oh, okay. um, you shouldn't, uh, if yeah. you're a two person company, start with project management and metrics right. and have everything documented. Yep. Doesn't make sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that um, it's a great question and there's, there's different approaches to it. I, I think, um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're thinking about building something, the sales and marketing engine is the most important engine, right? Um, for, for, for starters, because you're working with a clean slate, you don't have any clients, you don't have any revenue. If you don't have effective sales and marketing people, and the chances are it's one person, right? When you're an early stage founder, uh, who knows enough about both functions to be dangerous and can go out to the market and, and generate awareness and generate new business. Um, I think that's the most important piece. Uh, I think establishing community uh, and doing content marketing like like podcasts and you know making sure that you're leveraging social channels um, if you're a product that can market to a, a community like build a community I think that is the biggest difference between web 2 and web 3 is the community like the marketing instead of being like top down funnel you put out ads leads come in the sales team qualifies them and then they go like you can build a community around a product or service that you have and it becomes a little bit of a marketing engine like from the bottom up instead of top down. Um, but, you know, and, and I think that finding those fervent followers who really love your brand and really love what you're building um, is something that will help you go to market more effectively. And then once you start getting some deals in and you start making some revenue, like getting somebody in operations who can look at are you approaching the market the right way? Are you going after the right clients? Is the is the velocity of your outbound, you know, um, effective? Like, are you going after the right market? Do you have a really good understanding of the target audience and the target clients that you're going after? Because a lot of early stage founders just spray and pray, right? They're like, we're going to go after whoever will give us money. Understandable when you're early stage, but you have to, if you really want to establish a, a long-term approach, like, you have to be very focused on what your ideal customer is and be relentless about pursuing that customer. Um, and that's where I think when you, when you get to the point where you've got enough runway to last, you know, three to six months, you start looking for somebody that can look at the data and, and, and generate insights that can help you focus your attention, uh, really, really crystal clear. Um, and, and then from there, like, project management and all that stuff, like, I think that comes later, right? That's when, that's when you've got plenty of clients and plenty of business and revenue. Um, and you've got more business than you know what to do with, uh, and that you have bodies to handle. 
that's that's when you turn towards project management and stuff like that absolutely um i think as well uh project management should be more out of necessity right because yes. you're needy <laughs> and i think you're bloody well sure when you need it so that's yes <laughs> gonna be obvious yeah usually usually you're you're you know if you wake up every morning and you're like i feel like i just got buried in snow <laughs> yeah. um you know because i've got so much to do but that's when you might need to look for some help yeah. and i would say too like in the earlier stages of a business you don't have to hire somebody full time like you could probably hire somebody that can can spend a couple hours a week familiarizing your, themselves with your systems and with your data and then just helping you you know every two weeks have a call where it's like okay here's how you're progressing right like i think that you're going to see i think you're going to see a lot of that in in the future going forward like there's there's always going to be people that have full time jobs and prefer that but there will probably be a lot of people who are perfectly happy to just have some income coming from different places and they're willing to be consultants to help out on a, on a part-time basis. And that seems like a good play for early, early stage companies. Yeah. Oftentimes it's also much less complicated, right? Because these consultants are oftentimes actual freelancers or something like that. And you don't need to, or at least in Austria, you have a ton of overhead when it comes to hiring employees and they're super expensive as well so you yeah. usually pay three times as much to the government to what the employee actually gets wow How really yeah i didn't know that yeah holy smokes yeah. also two-thirds of the whole wage goes to the government or insurance companies and everything and one third yeah. is yeah it's crazy wow. yeah that is crazy yeah i mean so yeah <laughs> Definitely, if that's the case, you want to work with freelancers. <laughs> you don't want to bring on the, the the hires until you know they're you're you're you've got enough cash to sustain it. Yeah, well, um, usually you should always only hire right. If you that's true. Have, yeah. <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> Any business should do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. That cool stuff. Awesome. Um, what one question that I think is especially when it comes to startups. A really interesting one has less direct is less directly related to scaling itself but how to actually approach business i would say and founders usually approach one of two approaches raising money bootstrapping right what is your take on that i know it's a big question my, my take is bootstrap until you cannot bootstrap any longer uh and if you are able to bootstrap and you're really good at like if you can bootstrap a business and you can grow it into a business with sustainable revenues and never take VC money I think that's awesome um, I think that venture capital is one of those things where it, it, it's a double edged sword right because you no longer have full autonomy you are reporting to people that have invested in you and expect return and their expectation is that you will return uh, value to them quickly, right? Like very quickly. Um, and, you know, I think that that, that, that is an additional pressure and an additional distraction that can be very, very difficult for founders. So, um, if you are, you know, very passionate about what you're doing, you're good at sales, you're good at marketing, you are analytical and can think about sort of the data, you're flexible and adaptable, and you're just driven as all hell. And you have some good people around you that can help um i say bootstrap all, all day any day uh, if you can avoid vc cash absolutely makes sense yeah um the less stake uh, stakeholders are on the table the easier exactly so, awesome um yeah cool stuff um one last question for my and that's even one of those that i have sent uh, to you because i think cool. that's uh also one of those uh, either or uh, scenarios there is always this nuance of, well, let's start with marketing, brand, reach, sales, that kind of approach mm -hmm. versus have the product versus have the service pipeline, like be ready, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you're offering mm -hmm. and build that kind of a uh, part of the business out first. Mm -hmm. I feel like I know it already, but please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it, I think the answer the, the answer that's not as fun is is, is it depends right um, because if you're building a SaaS model and a product that 
you know, you're trying to sell to somebody and you're expecting it to be uh, functional outside of the box and then they're going to write you a big check and they're going to work it like then then, you know, in that scenario, yeah, focusing on the product is important. But I think you hear all these stories about founders where it's like we, you know, we went to a client and they agreed to sign up. And so we like pulled together this stuff and we built a whole new module on our product because that's what they asked for and they had cash and we wanted the cash. So we did it. Um, and you, you know, I think there are examples of companies that start out with this idea of what they're building. And then the client comes in and says, you know, yeah, we'll sign up, but we, we need this functionality. So all of a sudden that functionality gets built in debatable if that's the right approach, right? Because we talked about being unwavering, right? In your vision for what you're building, but at the same time, you need money to keep the business going and you need to be open to different ideas and listen to the market and hear what they're saying. So you do want to be agile and you do want to build but you also don't want to get, it's easy to get distracted by that. Like I've worked at companies where it's like, you know, you've got 15 clients, they're all asking for different things, but nobody's really prioritizing. Okay, well, what is the actual thing that they're asking for that we haven't built yet? And how do we distill that? And I think one of the things that is very, very important whenever you're a founder is, or in an early stage startup, is look at the problems that you're facing from multiple angles, multiple perspectives. A lot of times it's very easy to be like, okay, I have a problem. I'm reacting to the problem. First solution that comes to my head is the one that I'm going to go with. Sometimes that's right, but I always, the, the, the sort of wisdom of having done it a couple times has made it so that I typically will not come up with a strategy or decide what the plan is until I've looked at it from a couple different angles and spoken to a few different people and kind of got their input on it um, because, you know, uh, many minds make light work. I think that's the saying, right? Like the, if you can talk to people about it and get their different perspectives, you'll have a better understanding of what, what you should do. So I, I think that that's kind of my thinking is you have to go sales and marketing first and foremost, uh, and then really listen. If you, if you're, if you're focused on the, on the target that you're going after and you really listen to what they want and they've at least bought into what you're, selling enough to like see a product or pay you for it, then that should inform how you kind of evolve the business a little bit uh, in the earliest stages. And then obviously once you get to like a, a level of maturity where you've got product market fit, you're not making significant shifts to the business or the product because a client says so, right? But in the early days, listen to what the clients want. Awesome. Hey, thanks mate uh, for that. Really, I learned a lot myself. Awesome. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> Do you uh, maybe have, let's say, three key takeaways for people to remember from this course session? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, approach each decision or problem from multiple angles. Uh, you know, even if you don't necessarily have a ton of people on your team, think about, OK, what's the pro of this approach? What's the con of this approach? And be really ruthless with with how you judge something. Um, because that way you're looking at it from all angles and you can say that you made an informed decision. Um, two is, is sort of hire people who are passionate about what you're doing as passionate as you are, um, and, and are willing to put in the work to grow the business, right? Like, like we talked about at the top of the call, somebody that is willing to do whatever you need them to do to help get the business to where you want it to be. Um, if you hire somebody that's very rigid or very focused on a specific type of function, that's that's more that's better for later in the business you want a generalist who is passionate as hell about what you're building and will work side by side with you to build that right and and you know that that is important and then the third is just evangelize the hell out of what you're building right um nowadays you know there's no shortage of social media channels and digital outlets through which you can put out content so it's important to make sure that people are aware of your brand and aware of your business and aware of what you're doing. Uh, they know the people behind the operation and the company. Um, so those are my top three, I think. So you heard it, guys. Uh, let's sign up for TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. I mean, there's, it, 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 you don't have to be on all of them, right? You, again, it comes down to like really understanding where are the eyeballs of your target audience or your target customer. Um, and then double down on that and make sure that they're always seeing you in those channels. 
Awesome. Love it. Hey, really, thanks again, mate. Uh, was a pleasure. Really enjoyed the oh, discussion. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. I appreciate it. And good luck with same, everything. Same. You know, keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome. Thanks, buddy. Hey, thanks everyone for watching. See you soon. Wave Act, the web-free software company that understands what you want.